G'day guys, this is Andrew Price here from BlenderGuru.com and in this video tutorial, I'm gonna be showing you how to create a professional logo animation for a movie company. So this that you can see right here is uh, is for a fake company that I created called Emerald Pictures. Um, and it is the exact result that I'm gonna be showing you in this tutorial. So I'm hoping that from the techniques and things that I show you in the tutorial, you can then use that to apply it to your own personalized animation for your own uh, company or logo or whatever it is that you're trying to promote. Um, so if you've ever tried to make uh, a logo animation before, you'll know that it sounds easy on paper uh, and then you open up Blender and then you realize that there are a million and one different ways uh, that you could present uh, that animation and uh, it all becomes a little bit daunting and, uh, and then you start doing things that are a little bit silly, moving the camera around too much and, uh, and it gets a little bit funny after a while. So um, I think uh, the first thing first, before we get started, um, I think we actually should cover some theory uh, regarding Regarding logo animation. So I say theory, um, you know, it's a PowerPoint presentation. That's about as close as it gets. Um, so I put together some tips. Um, I went out and looked at a whole bunch of animations. I wrote down some tips on the best ones and I'm going to display them right now. So first things first, um, go ahead and do just that. Go to YouTube and watch as many logo animations as you can. Just by doing that, you will learn a lot. You will learn what works and what doesn't work. Um, and write notes as well. Like really, get out a pen piece of paper and write out some notes. So if you find a good one, just write out some things that you think look good, why they work, you think, and uh, and then move on to the next one. And then by the end of it, you'll have a whole list of notes which you can then use that for your own animation. Um, now, first things first, um, you need to be thinking about what your company stands for. That's really, really important because that is the basis, the foundation for the whole logo animation. Uh, if you don't give any thought to this, it's not going to match and it's obvious, it can actually hinder your brand rather than promote it. So you want to make sure that you get it right. Um, so think about what it stands for and how you can portray that. Um, so is the company like professional? Are they creative? Uh, is it like an extreme sports company? All those things, um, they're really going to be building the actual animation itself. So give that some thought. Um, now, as a tip, it's a good idea to start the animation slowly and then build up to it. So, reveal just a little bit at the start. So, make it look kind of like a blurry picture or something like that or like zoomed far away or something and then slowly pull out to reveal uh, the full logo. Uh, if you look at pretty much any movie production logo animation, they all pretty much do that. They start out with something blurry, a little bit something, you're not quite sure what's going on in the background there, and then suddenly the logo appears and it all makes sense. Um, that's just a way, it's just a way to kind of draw the viewer in. If you make it kind of like a puzzle, um, the viewer will then want to kind of figure out what's going on, and then it'll obviously build up to the logo animation, rather than just, blam, here's the logo, and people go, oh yeah, that looks pretty amateur. So, um, yeah. Tip, all right, uh, keep it under 10 seconds, the shorter the better. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one that has seen a few animations on YouTube or a few intros that are a little bit too long. Uh, I've seen some that are like longer than 30 seconds. Don't do that. Uh, it annoys the viewer, especially if the video is only 30 seconds long itself and you got a 30 second long logo intro. Uh, yeah, that, that that's not good, that's not good. Um, I, I mean, like, a minute long and you've got half the video as an animation. Don't do that. D try to keep it under 10 seconds. That might sound really short, but to the viewer that will seem longer than it is. Uh, people get annoyed when they see uh, animation. So do try to keep it as short as possible. Uh, and this is just uh, an observation I made. Most intros end with the logo on a black background. Now that's not a rule. You can break that, obviously. But uh, if you want to keep it consistent with, I guess, you know, how the movie production companies do it, that's something to think about. And last but not least, spend some time on the sound design. You don't want to do some awesome visuals and then go out there and get some cheap free sound effects online, throw them all together, and it just ruins everything. You want to put some thought and some effort into the sound design so that they actually mesh together and uh, and that's will, what will really help to um, sell the professional level result. Um, so that is something to think about as well. Uh, now this is not mine, but it is a brilliant example of a logo animation and uh, so I thought I would include it here just to show you um, basically how a good logo animation should look. Um, it was created by Colin Levy who some of you may know was the director of Sintel. Um, he's now actually working at Pixar, 
um, but he created his own uh, movie production house or name uh, called Lightning Hill Productions or Pictures, and um, and he created this all by himself using Blender. Um, and he gave me permission to put it in this tutorial, so I thought I would show it here. Um, so you can see that you know it uses everything we just talked about um, in that little that those little tip list. Um, it starts out slow, pulls out, it sort of makes you curious what's going on. Um, it pulls through a house, uh, and then bam, at the end there, there's the logo on the black background. It's very impactful. It's very slick, very professional, and it reflects the name. It's you know it's got to do with movies, storytelling, stuff like that. And, um, and I think it's perfect for its use, and, uh, and it's a brilliant example. So uh, I'm really glad that Colin gave me permission to include it. Um, but yeah, that's it. So um, let's get into the tutorial. Um, before we start, I'll just show you what the finished scene is actually made up of. So um, this is it right here. This is what it looks like in Blender. So I'm just going to play the animation right now. Um, so this is the end of it. And all right, here's the start. So you've got this emerald, which is blocking the view of the camera. And the emerald pulls out. Whoosh, there goes the emerald pictures. Da, 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 da. And that little plane that flies across there, that little whoosh, um, that guy is uh, that's casting a reflection on the surface of the me of the metal there, which is what gets that nice sheen effect across it at the end there. So that's a cool little thing I decided to throw in there. Um, but in this tutorial, um, I'm going to be showing you how to do everything. So we're going to be making the text first, giving it a brushed metal material, making the gemstone, uh, putting in the light, stuff like that to get the reflections. Then doing this particle, so we get this nice um, you know, floating particles. You can see there the effect that it's got. And that looks really cool when you've got a camera that's out of focus. It gives you that nice depth of field in the background there. So I'll show you how to, be, uh, how to do that. Um, we'll do a little bit of compositing, I guess, <laughs> at the end there. Um, just adding in the glare, the nice shiny effects and things like that. As well as, of course, the animation. So a whole bunch of stuff in this tutorial. So without further ado, I think it's time we go and get started. So, first things first, let's go ahead and add in that text. So you can go ahead and add in anything you want. Um, for your example, I'm, of course, using the fake company name Emerald Pictures. Uh, now, first thing you need to do is, of course, change that font. Do not ever use the default um, Blender font. If I find anybody that uses this for anything, um, you're going to be in big, big trouble. Always change it. Um, it comes free with Blender, that font. So I guess it's like an open source font. Um, but I don't think it was actually designed to be used for anything useful. Just, just there so you can actually see um, you know, what it is you're typing. But you should always change the font to something else. So I'm using the font Optimus. Princeps, uh, which is one that I got off dafont.com. So if you go there, and it's a great, uh, great site for finding fonts, by the way. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, but anyway, this is one I'm using that I thought worked quite well for the name Emerald Pictures. Um, so currently, it's 2D. It's completely flat. So we want to add some depth to that. So over here in the uh, in this panel here, I'm going to change the extrude amount to be 0.05. And there you see, you've got the text has got a little bit of thickness. Um, but the trouble is, is that the corner of that text is really, really sharp. And you want it to be catching more of the light so that you get more reflections and things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and bump up this bevel amount to be 0 0.009. And you can see now you've got some bevel there. And I'm also going to turn up the resolution for that. I'm going to turn that up to 4 so that you get even more reflections and more little glints of light as the, uh, as the camera goes around and stuff like that. Um, there's a problem though, once you add in that bevel, you can see that you get this weird effect. Now this happens from time to time when you add in depth and bevel and stuff like that, um, where the font gets distorted and then you get this little, you know, errors happening basically. So, um, we needed to convert this anyway, so we might as well go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Alt C and then hit Mesh from Curve. And what that's done is it's now actually made it an editable mesh. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and fix this little problem right here. Now, you might not have this depending on what font you used, but if you do, uh, this is what I would recommend doing. Um, let me just fix it properly, I guess. There we go. Move this up there. All right. Now, I'm, I guess I'm not really doing a proper job. This is kind of a hack, I guess. Um, you know, if this was going to be up really close with the camera, you might, well, you would want to spend a lot more time on this, but given that the camera is not going to be seeing most of this, I can get away with just patching it so that, oh, actually, that's not too bad. 
Okay, that's um, yeah, pretty good. Um, anyway, that's a quick way to fix that. Um, now, the reason that we converted this to a mesh, other than uh, you know also fixing that little problem, um, but we want to be applying a brushed metal shader to it. So we want this nice, you know, brushed metal, so it looks like it's been brushed. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. I hope so. Uh, uh, but we need to have UV coordinates for that, so it needs to be an actual mesh. Um, so anyway, now it's a mesh, we can UV unwrap it. So I'm going to split the viewport. I'm going to change this to be UV image editor. Going into edit mode, selecting all the vertices, I'm going to hit U and then project from view. And I just want to position it so that it's like square in the grid like that. That's pretty much all you need to do. Bam, it's now UV unwrapped. So uh, I guess I shouldn't have closed that so quickly. I need that again. I'm going to change this now to be the node editor. And I'm going to be going and adding in a new material. So. This is the node editor right here. Um, actually, you know what? I've started doing it um, this way now. So splitting it that way because the node editor works a lot better horizontally than it does vertically. So I'm starting to uh, split it horizontal or vertically. You know, you know what I mean? Like this as opposed to like that. <laughs> anyway, all right. So uh, first thing we need to do is add in a glossy shader like that. And this roughness value there, that's going to be the amount of or the softness amount of the reflection. So I'm going to set that to be 0 0.05. The closer you make that to zero, the more it's going to be a mirror. So uh, making that 0 0.05, that'll look cool. Now, in order to get the brushed metal effect, what we need to do is add in a texture. And in this instance, we're going to be using the noise texture, which for the oldies of Blender used to be called the cloud texture, but it's now been changed to noise. Um, and we're going to go ahead and, uh, well, let's just, let's see how this looks. All right, so I'm going to go, first of all, to, uh, to make it apply to bump. Um, you could just go ahead and connect that straight to the displacement, but that's going to give you 100% maximum bump, and it's going to look absolutely horrible. So the way to uh, to change the amount of bump, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is to add in a math node, change this to be multiply, and then this value, the one in the bottom right there, that's going to be the amount of bump that you give it. So let's just set that to be, yeah, all right, let's go 0.1. All right, let's see how that looks. Um, now, we won't actually be able to see anything if we were to render this right now um, because there's no lights or, well, there is a light, but I'm going to delete it because we don't actually want that one. Um, so in order to get this to work, um, let's just position the cursor there. Um, I'm going to add in a plane. I'm going to rotate this by 90 degrees so it's the same as the plane itself. I'm going to stretch that out. Pull that down up like this. Now, so I'm just making this long bar there. Now, this is just to cast some reflection onto the surface of the text. Uh, now, for this, I need to go ahead and give this a material as well, just so that we can, you know, see things as we're working. Um, so I'm going to give this an emitter value of 5, not 58, 5. Okay. Um, so now let's just save this. And I'm going to set this to rendered. And there we go. You can now see the text as it's looking. Now you can see it's got this horrible looking, smudgy looking stuff. Now that's actually our noise texture right here. So you can see that if we increase this scale amount, that that value decreases, uh, or it gets smaller, I should say. The trouble is, is that the, we've got so much bump going on that it's hard to, excuse me, it's hard to see what's happening. So if I just set this to be 0 0.005, then you can see uh, if we zoom in there, you can see it's a lot clearer. Now we actually want this scale to be uh, to be a lot smaller. So let's try 2,000. Let's just see how that looks. Uh, yeah, you know it's not too bad. But anyway, um, this is uh, well. First of all, because we've UV unwrapped it, we should be using the UV coordinate. So let's do that right now. Add a texture coordinate node and then plug that into UV. Okay, so you can see that's changed already because it's now using the UV coordinates. You can see you've got the bump map there, which is cool. Um, but now in order to get that brushed metal, we want it to actually um, stretch the texture. Now you normally don't want stretch textures, but in this instance you do. You want it to stretch across that surface of the, uh, of the, of the text. So in order to do that, I'm going to go and add in a mapping node. Drop this bad boy in right there. And then this X scale, I'm going to make that something really small, like 0.02. And there we go. Now we've got some stretched texture and it now looks like brushed metal. Yay! But I think it's too stretched because you do want there to be a little bit of the original cloud, you know, a little bit of variation to it. Um, but that's pretty good. It's not too bad. And then you want it to stretch in the other direction as well. You know, the, uh, 
across the, you know, that way, uh, the part that's now hidden. Uh, anyway, so I'm just changing that Z value as well, but that's fine. Uh, now this this multiply value there, I think that's a little bit too high. I changed that to be 0 0.03. Uh, but I think that's pretty good. It's not too bad. Um, now this plane right here, we're actually going to be using this in our final one, so that's uh, that's pretty cool. And we'll just keep that the way it is. Um, but I guess now is probably a good time to be positioning the camera. So let's go ahead, add in the camera, and then we can know where we're about to, we should be putting in our lights and stuff like that. Um, all right, well, we've got a camera already. But anyway, I've just added in another one. And going into front view mode, I'm going to hit Control, Alt, Number Pad, 0. Oh. There we go. <laughs> All right, um, now in this instance, I think it's actually good if we turn on uh, in the camera display here, you've got safe areas. And I'm assuming that is like, I don't know, what's been decided as, you know, how close something can be to the edge of the screen. So this, I think it used to be called title safe. So in this instance, it's quite helpful. So you can see you've got now this like invisible border around where the camera's looking. So just make sure the text is inside that area. So that's pretty cool. Um, so let's uh, let's have a look at it from the rendered view. It's pretty good, um, but I actually want this plane to be further back. Let's move that there, and then that's going to make the reflection on it a little bit more diffused across the surface, so that you get light at the bottom of the text as well, which is important. Um, and as well as that, we want some light underneath the text, so that you get a little bit more oomph, I guess. Um, like a little bit of power, sort of like shining light up underneath the text. So let's give this, um, make it a separate material. And I'm going to give that three. And I'll make the color of this lamp yellow. Just so that it has, um, you know, a little bit something else going on. Oh, that ding sound, by the way. I'm not sure if you heard it, if the microphone picked it up or not. The ding sound, um, it's thanks to a great add-on. I love it. Those of you on the uh, on the Facebook page will know I just posted about it, but it's called Render Music. It's an add-on which you can get. Uh, I'll put a link there if you're looking at this uh, video on Blender Guru. You can download the add-on Render Music. It makes a ding sound when the render is complete. You can configure it. You can change the sound. I made it make a ding sound. But anyway, it's great. Um, I don't know how I've lived without it basically. But anyway, getting off topic. So got these planes here. Um, you can see that they're showing up in the render. Now, we actually don't want them in the render, believe it or not. They look quite ugly, I think. So, in order to do that, in order to stop it showing up in the render, um, with the plane selected, if you go to the... Is that the object? I never know the names. Yeah, it's the object panel. Um, underneath Ray Visibility, uncheck Camera. And then do the same for that bottom one there as well. Let's give that a render now. And voila! We do not see those planes in the render but everything else is fine. I'm gonna turn up the samples just for the render, you know, just so you can actually see it a little bit clearer because uh, 10 isn't really enough to be able to judge what's happening. Um, and that's pretty good, that's not too bad. If you wanted to, you could uh, you could give the glossy shader a little bit of a slightly blue color, but that's just getting a little bit finicky. Blue is kind of like the color for like steel, um, like, I'm not sure. There's like different colors for different metals, but that's what I read is like steel. So that's what I've been running with. Anyway, moving on. So the next thing we're going to be doing is adding in a gem stone. Okay, so, uh, you know, like a diamond or maybe an emerald. Um, now, if you go ahead and you Google um, the word diamond, um, you'll see... The diamonds are kind of a complex shape, and you can't just really get away with like adding a cube and you know making it look like a diamond. You can't do that. It's it's quite hard. And I tried to model a diamond before I realized that uh, there's actually a tool built right into Blender which um, will actually create them for you. Um, it is an add-on which somebody has created, which is very handy, uh, and it is called. If you go down here, add mesh. It's called the extra objects add-on. So if you go ahead and enable that. If you then go and hit Shift A, then go Mesh, you get Extra Objects, Gemstones, and then you've got Gem. Bam, look at that. Woo! Done for you. And then if you press T, you bring up this toolbar here. Let me just make this bigger. Bring up the toolbar, and you can actually change it even more. You can customize it, and that is exactly what we're going to do right now. So let it just fool around with this a little bit. Let's just uh, have a bit of fun. Oh, I can't remember. What, I can't remember the settings that I used. Uh, that's annoying. Uh, 
Okay, all right, let's go radius 0.8. Yeah, I've got the settings now. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, 0.35, that's fine. And then the pavilion height, I'm going to make that 0.9. Segments 10, and that is now going to be our emerald. Now, I guess technically this is like a diamond shape. Um, but from what I had a look on, I googled the word emerald, and uh, uh, there, there appeared to be um, you know many different cuts that you can do for you know gemstones. It's not... You know, this isn't just a diamond shape. Yeah, I think it is traditionally, but anyway. Don't even get me started on diamonds. Just had to, you know, I recently proposed to uh, to my girlfriend, now fiancé, and I uh, had to buy her a ring, as you do. Man alive, diamonds. Phew, I will never understand that concept. But anyway, it's getting it's getting off topic again. Um, uh, yeah, so I've... I've just as I've been talking, dropped in this gemstone right here, and uh, and I'm moving this text apart. So I actually want to make this pictures here, this second word. I'm going to make that a separate object. So you press P, and then there we go. It's now a separate object. Now the uh, the origin point is still set up over there. So uh, you want to make sure that it rotates according to you know the corner right there. So I'm just going to select one of these vertices right here. Hit cursor to selected, then Control Alt Shift C. One of the hardest uh, keyboard shortcuts to press. And then I'm going to hit Origin to 3D Cursor. And then now it will rotate according to uh, where it should be. So it's all looking great. Awesome. So now we've got to move the camera again a little bit. That's fine. Um, all right. Now looking at this gemstone, of course, we want to give it a material. So let's go ahead, add a new material right here. And this one is actually quite simple. It is glass shader and connect that and then I'm going to set the color to be of course a greenish aqua light color just like so and then if we give this a render right now let's have a look you can see it looks terrible it actually it really does look terrible I mean I, I was planning on saying that anyway but it, I mean it really really does look terrible um, now the reason for that is that Diamonds by themselves, I guess. I guess in the real world, they're a lot better at like picking up little light sources and things like that, and shining them and stuff. You know, and they look very pretty. And I guess it helps having the setting and all that extra stuff. Uh, gemstones, not diamonds. This is an emerald, not a diamond. Um, but it uh, in you know in three D world, uh, you need to have you need to have stuff. You need to have light sources that it can reflect. Now, currently, you've only got these two light sources. So, which is why when you render it. Um, all you get is something that looks really, really bland and boring because it's got refraction, so it's getting the background, which is solid black, and uh, thank you, ding, um, it's getting that background, and uh, there's not a lot going on for it to uh, to refract. Uh, so what do you say we fix that, eh? Um, well, the easiest way to fix it is to actually add stuff into the world um, which the gemstone, our emerald, can actually use. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get fancy with some world nodes. Ooh, yeah. Um, so going down here in the node editor, I'm going to click on that little world icon, and I'm going to click use nodes. And I'm going to be using something which uh, I don't think I've ever done. I might be one of the first. This is, maybe this is a blender first. You know why? Because this is crazy. Nobody would, in their right mind, add a checker node to the background, because that would look terrible, wouldn't it? Yeah, let's give it a try. Let's have a look. Oh, yeah, it looks really, really bad. Um, but there's a purpose to it. You can see if we zoom in there on our on our gemstone, we've got some interesting looking shapes now, some interesting refractions and reflections, and it all looks very cool. And if I change that color to be black, you can see it looks uh, looks even better. So you can see where I'm going with this, right? Okay. All right, let's move this gemstone to a separate layer, and let's just focus just on that. Now, I'm going to change the uh, the background. First of all, I'm going to change that strength to be 3, so it's a little bit brighter. And I'm going to change the scaling for for our check it. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I bet you didn't expect to be hypnotized whilst watching a tutorial video. There's a first for everything. Okay. Um, so, having it in the background, like if we render this right now, it is actually part of the render. That's not like, you know, ding, yep, you're hypnotized now. And now you will do whatever I tell you. Um, no, the uh, it, it is actually part of the render. So we don't want that, do we? We actually just want, uh, we, we, we love what's going on with the gemstone, but we don't want it as part of the world. So the way around that is to add in a light path node. Drop this in right here. 
and I'm gonna set, gonna add in a mix node, add this in. Um, where do I do that? Maybe right here. Yes. Something you need to be aware of. Um, you can see these colors here. Green goes into green. Um, you get into trouble when you do stuff like have one with a yellow input and you put that in there. You know, if I just take that and I just drop that in there, you can see it just completely destroys the render. So you want to make sure that the, uh, you know, it's color coordinated to help you out. So just remember that. Um, now, so for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the output from the is camera ray and I'm going to put that into the mix input. And what that's going to do now is it's going to keep the uh, it's going to keep everything the way it was inside the diamond, but now the background is going to be whatever I put into this bottom input. So if I make this a solid black, as you can see I have done, now we've got all that stuff that's still happening inside the diamond. Uh, I keep saying diamond, inside the emerald, but everything else um, is black, the background, which is what is important. But you can see we've also got some uh, reflections, and if we add in our add in our text again, you can see that it's now colored, um, it's colored our text, which we don't want. Um, so, and it's also made, you know, it's a little bit shiny on the outside of the emerald and stuff. So it's picking up gloss as well. So we don't want the gloss either. So the way around that is if I add in another mix node, actually let's just duplicate this one, duplicate that. And then let's take the output of the is reflection ray, drop that in right there. And now it's not actually powering the gloss either. It's now just powering the, uh, I guess, just the refraction. That's pretty much all that's left. So now you've got some interesting stuff happening inside there. And the rest of the scene is untouched, which is the way it should be, basically. So it's looking pretty cool so far. So let's go ahead, give this a render, see how everything looks. It should be looking pretty fine. And um, if it is all looking good, then we can go ahead and move on. Ding! Emerald pitches, bam, looking pretty good. Next step is to add in the background. So black is great, um, but we want it to look interesting. So for the background, um, if you don't remember what we uh, what I showed at the start, the animation, it's got like a fuzzy, kind of like a floating depth of field type background. Um, and so how we're going to do that in Blender is we're going to be using a particle system to create some particles and then they're going to be floating around in the background and then the camera is going to be out of focus, at least for the background, and it should hopefully look very cool if we've done it correctly. So the way to do this, uh, we need somewhere for the particles to be generated from. So I need to add in a plane and looking at it from the camera viewport, so about that size I guess, that's pretty good. And you want to make sure that it is positioned so that it is off camera, just like so, just so that you get part, because this is going to be an animation. So this is, we're on frame one right now. And so I'm going to go ahead, hit I, and then select keyframe location. And then now I'm going to jump to, let's say frame 10. Let's just, uh, I'll make this, this little tiny window down here. I'm going to make this the timeline. Yeah, there you go. Actually, that wasn't a good idea. I don't have much control over it. But anyway, you can see right there, it's on frame 10 right now. Um, so I'm going to position the fr uh, this board, this plane, above the camera right now. And I'm going to hit I and then select location again. So now if we play that, we should see the plane moves over 10 frames. But you can see it starts and it slows down. Um, it, like when it starts off, it starts off slow. And then towards the end, it slows down as well. Uh, and that's because if you go to the F-curve modifier, the graph editor, I should say, change, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it's called anymore. It is called the F-curve. All right. Um, we don't want um, the Y and the X, by the way, so we can delete them. But this Z here, you can see that it's smoothed off. So I'm going to select those and then hit vector. Now when we play that, it's a straight animation from start to finish, which will mean we get an even distribution of particles when they are generated. Okay, so now that plane is in place, we can add in a particle system. And if we play that, it looks terrible, doesn't it? It looks absolutely terrible. So we need to change some settings. I'm going to change, first of all, the important one is the start and the end time for our particles. Let's make that 1 and 10. So now all those particles are generated in the first 10 frames, and that is all. Um, we want the lifetime of the particles to be 250, so that it in, you know, is alive for the entire duration of the animation. I'm going to make the amount of those particles 5,000. Let's save this before it crashes. There we go. Now you've got a whole bunch of particles. But they're falling. You can see. 
So let's go ahead and turn off the gravity because we don't want gravity. We just want them to be floating around in some, I don't know, space environment. But you can see that they're now like moving upwards, which is kind of weird. And the reason for that is that it's taking um, part of the animation of the plane itself. And the reason it's doing that is because it's got velocity, it's got a normal amount. So that normal amount will basically throw the particles around depending on how the object is moving. So we need to set that to be zero. And now, ta-da, we have particles. We have particles distributed throughout our scene, and it all looks lovely. Okay, cool. So now comes the fun part. Um, we want there to be little floating pieces, basically. I mean, these are just particles at the moment. We want them to actually show up in the render. And in order for them to show up in the render, it needs to actually be duplicating another object. I mean, you know, you've got, in the render, you've got halos, but fairly certain cycles doesn't render with halos and I hope it doesn't I hate halos halos are awful they always have problems and uh, it's an old-fashioned method don't ever use it <clears throat> um, so it needs to be uh, it needs, I'm getting really off topic in this tutorial um, it needs to be uh, it needs to be rendering an object so I'm gonna be adding in a circle so just add in a circle and uh, oh, let's do that again so we've still got the options there where are those options Hey, there we go. Okay, circle. I'm going to make the vertices count for that eight. Well, let's go six. I think we can get away with six. And I'm going to make the fill type end gone. No, let's go eight. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, so it provided it has a face. Hmm, <laughs> yeah, like that. Um, otherwise, it won't be showing up in the render. So make sure it does have a face. Um, and then down here in the render options, turn off emitter because we don't actually want this plane to show up at all in the render. It shouldn't, but just to check. And then change the dupli object to be circle. And then now you can see all of those particles are now this circle. So if I scale that up, they're all changing as well. Um, so I want to change the size of this to be 0 0.01. And you could also change the randomized size if you want, but we're going to leave it as is because let's just say all the dust particles are the same size. It doesn't really matter. Um, and what else are we going to be changing? Do, 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 do. Ah, yes, the Brownian amount. This is the key. Um, so the Brownian amount, what that's going to do is um, essentially just make it so that the particles drift around really softly, like really, really subtly. Okay, so let's just uh, let's just play this. Just see how it looks. Uh. Wow, that is really subtle, isn't it? They're barely moving. Oh, okay, that's because it's point 0.1. Okay, it should be point 0.1, not point zero 0.01. Point 0.1. Okay, there we go. There we go. You can see they're moving around slightly, just slightly. It's kind of hard to see them now because the, uh, the circles are rotated flat. So the next thing we're going to do is turn on rotation. Um, so we're going to change this velocity. We're going to change that to random. And I'm going to set that amount to be 2. I'm going to turn on dynamic so that it sort of like interacts and stuff. Um, I don't know. I just did some experimenting. I found that it worked. Um, the initial rotation, I'm going to make that random as well. So now if we play this, ta-da, look at that. Look at our scene right now in all its glory. So you can see now, I mean, this would be perfect for like, I don't know, like DNA or like space, the outer space. You zoom in on the molecules and they're all doing this kind of stuff. So this kind of effect, I mean, once you've set up this particle system and everything, you can use this technique for all sorts of logo animations. I mean, it's quite common. I mean, if you have a look at videocopilot.net uh, or .org, I can't remember, .net, yeah. Uh, you know, Andrew Kramer, the v, uh, After Effects guy. He does a whole bunch of title effects and, you know, logos and stuff like that. And he uses this type of effect a lot, like having particles that sort of drift around and stuff. And, um, well, at least a few times anyway. It looks cool, is, uh, is what I'm trying to say. So, anyway, it's all set up now. Um, now, for the circle, we want it to, uh, if we were to render this right now, we probably wouldn't actually be able to see very much because uh, not all of those particles are lit. Only the ones that are in range of those, of those planes. So, we want to make sure that um, the particles are showing up. So, uh, with our circle there selected, I'm going to give it an emit value. Let's make it an emitter of 4. And then now if we render it, you should see all of those particles are now displaying in, uh, in the render. So it looks, it is, uh, I said, looking pretty cool. Um, so let's go down here. I'm just going to change the size of these particles because I think they're a little bit too big. Um, but it should be fine. Um, now you can see that looking from our render, um, that it looks kind of like a star field. 
uh, which isn't good because we want, you know, we want to be, the, the aim is to really have the text separated from the background and currently it's all sort of mushed in together. And the reason for that is that there isn't any sense of depth um, you know, and contrast, I guess. It's all completely bright. Like these are all like completely white dots um, as well as the text. So it doesn't actually look that good. So we want to fix that. And the way to do that is by using depth of field so that the stuff in the background and the foreground is out of focus. So with our camera here selected, go to the camera options and we need something for it to focus on. Now in this instance, I'm going to use this word right there, which you can see in the bottom left hand corner or if you hit N, you can see the item name is called text. Um, so with our camera selected, let's go ahead, change that focus point to be text. And then I'm gonna use F-stops, because that's just you know what you use if you have a camera. Um, you could use radius as well, it doesn't really matter, it's just a measurement. Um, so I'm gonna use an F-stop value of 0 0.02. So now if we give this a render, yeah, it's really noisy. Okay, so that's one thing about depth of field is that it is really, really, really super, super noisy. So um, make sure that you turn up the sample so that you can actually see it properly. So let's give that a render now and uh, and let's see how that looks. I think it is actually still, um, I think maybe it's too, too much depth of field because the background is just showing up as like one big blurry mess as opposed to um, lots of little dots. So let's... Um, Let's turn that down. So basically, the higher you set that number, the less depth of, excuse me, the less depth of field you get. So if I set that to be like zero, you would get maximum extreme shallow depth of field. In fact, it probably just wouldn't really render that well. It'd just be terrible. Um, anyway, let's just have a look at how this looks once it is rendered. Ding, and there we go. It is now rendered. So it's looking pretty cool. Um, the background is looking nice and out of focus. E. The text is nice and clear. The diamond has gone a little bit out of focus. I think it's because the uh, the shallow depth of field is kind of making the, you know, it's losing some of that refraction. You could kind of get around that if you wanted to by upping that, and then you'd have to adjust the background, I guess. But it's overall it's looking pretty good. Um, so the next step is to add in the volumetric lighting, which is something that a lot of people always, uh, I guess in the last tutorial, a lot of people were asking me how I did that. So, uh, and I skipped it in the last tutorial, and then I had to go back and do like a bonus tutorial. It was kind of annoying. So I'll just show you. I'll just show you right now. Um, now currently in Cycles, let's just, uh, let's move that out of the way. In, in Cycles, there is no way to do volumetric lighting yet, although it is planned in the next two to three releases, so it should be, I don't know, four to six months probably. <laughs> um, so you can do it using a combination of cycles and the Blender internal render engine. So let's do that. So um, currently we've got our scene and it's using the cycles rendering engine. So if we want to combine the internal rendering engine, a separate rendering engine, we have to use a separate scene. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this plus button right here. And then I'm going to click on link object data. And what that's going to do is it's going to take a complete copy of our scene and it's going to um, it's going to link them all together so that now if I added an animation for the camera it would then reflect it in our other scene so you can see that right now there's no difference between the two they look exactly the same that's because they are basically duplicates of um, each other um, so for this second one I'm going to go ahead and call this volumetric lighting and um, the only thing we really need in our scene is these three objects right here and what this is going to do is because we're going to have a volumetric light shining down um, and we want these objects to block the light if they're in the way. Uh, and that's the only reason we want those. So in this scene, the only thing that's actually going to be rendering is the volumetric light. So this spotlight, which we're going to add. But these objects are going to act as, you know, block, like a mask. That's the word I'm looking for, mask, um, which is going to mask out the light when, um, when it should be, you know, wherever. So anyway. Um, now that we've got our separate scene here, we need to go ahead and change it to the Blender Rendering Engine. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and add in a spot lamp. Now this is a really quick and easy way to get volumetric lighting in your scene. So just look at it from the camera viewport, something like that, looks pretty good. So I'm just moving the spot lamp up just so that it is covering just where the camera is looking right now. So it's sort of shining down the side and it's coming out from there. You don't want it too close like that, otherwise it's gonna look really obvious that you know the light source is up there. But if you have it sort of off scene, it makes it look like the scene is quite big and you've got like a light that's further away. 
Um, and then the only thing you need to do is down there underneath Halo, you want to turn that on and then turn the steps up to B4, for example. Now, if we render this, it should be really quick. You can see you have volumetric light. And this, these little objects here, you can see are casting a faint little shadow just from underneath them. So that's kind of cool as well. Now, in order to get some cool lights, so you've got some like streak effects coming down there. Uh, we need to add something that blocks the light. Now, this is a method that was taught by... I can't remember his name. <laughs> it's the guy that did the underwater tutorial um, on Blender Guru, but he uh, he created this method. I thought it was really cool, so I'm going to show you how to do it. Um, essentially, you just add a plane, subdivide it a bunch of times. Seven times is what I used, or maybe eight. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah, we'll go eight. Um, so you subdivide it a whole bunch of times like this, and then you position it just above where the spotlight is, like there. And then you use the, let's say, this circle brush tool here. And I think I subdivided that too many times. Yeah, let's just let's go back one. There we go. It's just too many. It's just uh, it's a bit daunting. And you grab this circle brush tool. And then you just start taking out parts like this. Now, the point of this is to make it so that you get parts that have... You know, sort of like a 50-50, I guess. Um, so I'm clicking and then middle mouse clicking to take away. And so I'm just selecting some vertices, you know, deleting others. So just something like that. It doesn't have to be exact. Uh, and I've just deleted those vertices. And then now if I position that so that it is over where the spot lamp is looking. Also, if you turn on show cone. Hey, that didn't do anything. Why isn't it? Oh, okay. You have to be in uh, solid view mode. So click show cone. And you can see how it is, uh, you know, where the light is actually going to be cast. So something like that. And then now if we have a look. Ta-da! Ding! You can see we have a lot nicer looking volumetric light. Now, how do we combine the two? Well, let me tell you. You go to the compositor. This is in our scene, by the way. This is cycles now. Um... So we can, this is where we're going to be doing everything. The only thing we did um, was, uh, you know, that volumetric lighting. Anyway. Um, so, oh, oh, okay. All right. Let's go back. Let's go back to where we were. Let's go to the default. Okay. Let's change that. Okay. Um, we don't want these objects to actually render. We only want them to mask. Okay. So we need to go to the render layer panel here. And uh, we want to move this spot lamp. And that, and that plane, we want to move that to a separate layer. So let's move that to layer 3. And then in our render layer here, we want to make sure that we only select layer 3 there. And we want to make sure that it masks everything else. So click on all Z. So now let's give that another render. And you, it should look almost the same, I guess, as what it was before. But now that text isn't actually rendering at all. It's just masking. Okay. All right. Glad I've done that. I feel a lot better now. Okay, phew. All right, so to add the two, we need to go ahead and add in a render, a new render layer here. And you can see you've only got one render layer, which is, oh, what do we do? Well, you change the scene, buddy. Change it to volumetric lighting. And then now if we add in a viewer node, connect the two, and then let's add in a mix node. Set this to be add. Ta-da! It's that simple, folks. And then you just turn down this add amount to be something that you like. I guess that's too much. Let's go point zero five. You want it to be subtle. Because remember, you want to have the background dark enough that the text is separated from it. But the light does add a nice element to the scene. So you want the light to be visible, but not too visible. You want to have a nice balance. It's all about the balance. Um, all right, so next, we want to add a vignette, of course. Someone told me, ah, oh, I should have watched that video. There's a new method for creating a vignette or something using masks or something. Oh, I didn't watch that video. But anyway, let's just go ahead and do the method I always use. It works fine. If it's not broke, don't fix it, I guess is what they say. Um, although if you can't figure out what, you, what you're actually clicking on, what am I doing? Distort. Distort. Displays. Lens distortion. Can you for, realize, I mean, can you believe... That I forget how to make a vignette after I make them so many times. Um, okay, so I'm changing the... Uh, just adding in a, a math node. Set that to greater than. Lens distortion. You can see what I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to speed past this part because I, I'm kind of embarrassed I do it so much. And it just takes a while. 
set this to relative. Let's go 5%. Now let's go 10. Bump it up. Let's add a mix node. Let's set this to multiply. And there we go. So what that's done is it's now darkened the edges of the render. So the focus is now more on what's happening in the middle. So that's the whole point of that. And we can go ahead, make it look even nicer. Let's do some color grading. So we're going to add in a color balance node. Get this wheel in there. And I'm going to set the middle tones to purple color. Purpley pink, I guess. Yeah, like that. And then let's make the highlights green. Slightly green, not too much, just a little bit. Now, the reason I'm using those two colors is because they are complementary colors on the color wheel. They're opposites. So green is the only color that we've got to go off. So green, the opposite of green, is a purple color. So purple goes nice with green. So that's why I'm very subtly coloring it just like that. Okay. So now we want to do the compositing for the rest of it, which is our text. So we want to make sure that the text has a nice kind of glow effect to it. And more importantly, our emerald here has a nice shiny, dazzling glare effect to it. So the way we're going to do that is we, want to, we have to separate these objects from the rest of our scene. Because you can't apply an effect to just this without it applying you know, the rest of you know, everything that's currently happening. Unless we were to do... If we go over here to our object panel, and then down here underneath relations, you've got something called pass index. And chances are you've probably passed over this. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. Pretty clever. Um, but it's actually really helpful. You just go ahead, click on pass index, change that to any number. I'm just changing it to one. And then, so for both of these, the emerald and the pictures, I've made them pass one. Yeah. Yeah. Pass one, and then for our uh, diamond, emerald, I keep calling it a diamond, I'm going to make it pass index two. And then as well as that, you need to go to the render layers down here, and then turn on object index. Then once you've done that, you need to go ahead and give it another render. So give it another render now. Bing! All right, looks exactly the same, but if we go to the compositor, what we can do now is... Where is it? Is it vector? No. Is it converter? No. Oh, yeah, it is. Go to converter, ID mask, and then take the output of the index object, which is that one that we enabled in the layers down there. Uh, and then if we set that to be one, now, if we just add in a mix node right here, take the output, put it into the factor input right there. Let's flip that around. Make the output for that black. Ta -da! We now have the text uh, completely separated from the rest of the scene, so we can now add effects just to that text. So the first thing I want to do, or really the only thing I want to do to that text uh, at this time, is uh, just to add a blur, like a glow effect to it. So I'm adding in a blur node, and I'm going to set the yeah set it to fast Gaussian. Let's go X aspect correction. Let's go two percent. It's pretty good. Um, but what I actually want, I want that uh, I want that glow effect to actually only really apply to the top portion of the text, not really what's going on underneath. So I'm going to add in an, an RGB curve node, like here. And then I'm just going to add a nice sloping curve like that. And that's just going to get rid of the uh, low contrast areas, like so. And then if I just move all of this stuff over, let's just move this around... If I add in an add node, I'm sorry, a mix node, set it to add, and take the output from that. There you go. Now, if I just turn down this factor input, oh, make sure it's the right way around. Make sure it's always in the bottom input. Um, you can see that I now have control over how much glow is uh, is powering those uh, powering that text there. So I just want a subtle glow. So something like that should look pretty good. Now I want to do the exact same thing um, for our emerald. So I'm just going to duplicate that uh, that ID mask. I'm going to add this. I should have you know duplicated the mix node as well, but anyway, it's fine. I'll just mix this around. Um, so now, if I just change this index amount to be two, you can see that I now have full control over the uh, over the emerald. 
I used to do it so that I would separate things onto separate uh, separate layers. But when you do that, it actually has to render the scene twice, like once for all the objects and then once for whatever objects are on there. And it really does slow down the render times. But if you use it this way, you just render it once and then it just takes elements from that using an ID mask. So it's a lot better. Anyway, um, so for this, uh, for this particular emerald, I'm just going to be adding in... No, I didn't want that. What are you doing, man? You crazy. So it just, just grabbed it right out of my hand. Um, I want to add this glare effect to this, not what this thing is going on. Um, so let's just focus on this. I'm going to turn down the threshold. Okay, um, let's turn the mix up so it's just the glare effect. All right. And you can see the more I set that threshold to, then um, the uh, the less portions of that emerald is actually applying that glare to. So if you turn it up, you know, too low, then you just get like this fat, blurry glare. So you just want to get some sharp reflections like that. I'm just going to try it with that and see how that looks. Uh, I'm going to turn up the streaks effect to be 9. Turn up the iterations to be 5. Turn up the color modulation as well. Let's go 7. It looks a lot better if the if the actual color itself is white. In fact, if I wanted to, I could add in an RGB to black and white, and that would be. You'd think it would work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't. Oh, anyway, yeah, maybe just a maybe a saturation node here or something. Uh, if I just turned down the saturation, there you go. You got you got some nicer looking. Uh, color modulation. So the color modulation will really color that, you know, that streak effect, which is basically what happens when diamonds, you know, have that glinty, glary type look to them. So that um, that can really easily very fake that. So that's that's kind of a cool effect. So I'll just add in this add node in right here. Let's just drop that in. Um, so this is going to be applying that effect. Oh, let me just see. Okay, so I've got that. I'm applying it over the top of this. I can't see. Oh, yeah, it's just really, really faint. It's hard to kind of see what's going on. Let's just bring back some of the saturation of that emerald there. I don't know if that's helping at all. Uh, but anyway, let's maybe crank that up a little bit more. Let's go to... Eh, it's not It's not really working for me, but I think it's too green. And I think, uh, again, it's that, that depth of field is kind of a bit too much for the scene, so it's kind of overpowering if you get the picture. Um. Oh, one other thing I forgot to show you. Um, if you want to get more refractions in, in the gemstone, you can add a bevel effect. And then if I just turn this down, say like 2 or 3 or something, you'll get more refractions and it will just look overall a lot nicer. So that's just something to do. We'll, we, we'll re-render it in, uh, in a little bit as well. Uh, but let's just take a look at that. I mean, that's pretty good. That's, uh, that's pretty much how it is. I think, again, that volumetric effect is too overpowering. Let's just turn that down to 2, or uh, maybe 3, 0.03 perhaps. Again, you want to make sure you get the balance just right. Anyway, I'll give that a render again just with that bevel effect on the diamond, and we'll see if that makes any difference. Yeah, not really. Uh, it's pretty much the same. Uh, but, you know, if you had proper depth of field, I guess it would work a little bit better. But, anyway, that's it. That is the, uh, that's the still. That's done. Now, this is, of course, a tutorial about animation. So, we've got to have some animation in it. Um, so... Uh, this is the last frame of the animation, basically. So um, this being the final scene, obviously. Um, so we essentially just need to work in reverse. So we've already got the last frame done. Now we want to make it so that this text starts off camera, like behind the camera, and then it flies out and, uh, and goes to where it is right now. So with everything where it is right now, I'm going to go ahead and hit... Uh, insert, lo insert a keyframe, lock rot, which is, which is location and rotation. So I'm just going to do that for the diamond and the text, basically. Not the diamond, the emerald. Man, I keep getting them wrong. Anyway, uh, so that is on frame 250. I'm just going to change this to be timeline so we can now start doing stuff with it. Okay. All right, so we've got particles that are, go, that, uh, are generated up to, well, first of all, we should cache those particles so that, because you can see there's stuff going on. Like I'm on frame 10 right now, 20, and it's not, it's not there, so it needs to be baked. There we go. So up to frame 10, 10. So let's just make the starting frame of the animation 10. And we want this to be off camera. So this, uh, this pitch is one. This is the one that flies so that it goes like through the sea. 
like when the when it flies past it kind of you know goes through there um so you have to sort of think about the timing of the animation so thinking about what we said at the start you want to make sure that it starts off really subtle and uh you know doesn't reveal very much it's very vague and then it slowly you know brings in everything else together and then you get the final logo um as it you know as it's presented at the end um so it needs to start off you know as I said, on a vague note. So I want to make it so that it's actually looking through the emerald into um, the, uh, the refracted light of this word emerald. Um, so the diamond, really, I guess, well, we can position this one. That's what I was trying to do originally. Um, so let me just... No, okay. We'll do the diamond first, okay? Because I'm just trying to think about all the, the piecing and stuff. So you have to try and think about sort of how long you want that diamond to be uh, the gemstone, the emerald, how long you want that to be in front of the camera, like that kind of like vague stage. So I'd say about four seconds is pretty good. So thinking at 25 frames per second, four seconds is 100 frames. So that's where you want to put the keyframe. So let's just move this emerald right in there. See, I got it right that time. I actually said emerald, which is good. I'm going to move this here. It's going to be rotated. Um, how am I going to rotate it? Yeah, I think if I look about it through that top part, I don't know, maybe about there. I think that should be pretty good. All right. And then if I just set a keyframe for location, rotation, that should be good. And then let's do the same with our word emerald. Let's move this in. And I'm just going to rotate it just so that it has a little bit of movement when it flies out as well. Okay, that's pretty good. I'll move it in just a little bit tighter. Like so. And then I'll set that location, rotation. And I also want the camera to actually be zoomed in. Um, so that it's kind of like looking through that gemstone. So it's actually, I need to uh, animate this focal length. So I want it to be fully zoomed out at say, uh, let's say about 180. So I'm going to set the keyframe for 35 because that's where it's going to be. But at the start, up until about, let's say, uh, let's say 100. No, let's go 90. Mm, 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 90, yeah. Um, I want it to be zoomed in. So let's just grab this, zoom this right in. Let's say, yeah, 60 is pretty good. Let's place a keyframe at 50. I'm sorry, at 60. So now if we play that, you can see what's happening. So it's not that hard to really get a, uh, you know, Lego animation. It's pretty easy when you think about it. Um, now this initial part you want, obviously you don't want a static image to be right there. You want this emerald to be moving slightly. So at the starting frame of this animation, I need this to be, if I just look at it, let's say right there. So I'm looking at the emerald directly overhead. If I rotate this, um, okay, where was it? All right, let's just try that again. Yeah, I'll rotate it slightly, a little bit like that. I'll place another keyframe there. And then I'll rotate it slightly this way as well. Location, rotation. Okay, cool. So now if I play that, you can see that the emerald is slowly moving like that, which should get some cool looking refractions. Okay, so let's just try it. Let's just give it a whirl, see how it looks. Now the problem is, is that actually at this, you know, where everything is right now, having depth of field would be crazy. Um, the depth of field would just make everything blurry. It would take forever to render. So actually what I did is I actually used the defocus node in the compositor. So if I just go here and then use defocus, if I just drop that in. And let's say move it right to the front. It's got to be whenever it is referenced there. Let's just add a little route. This is something that's cool. It's a new feature for compositing. You've got the reroute feature. So you can then use that. Let's just drop that in there, move that. Just replacing everything where it is referenced. The cool thing about the reroute feature is I can just have that point right there. And then if I want to drop something in between, I don't have to go through and connect all of those one by one. I just have to connect that one right there, which is kind of cool. So now I can add some defocus here. Now, I guess technically this is like a, 
I don't know, an outdated um, outdated feature, the defocus node, you should be using the cycles defocus thing. But it makes really, really smooth looking um, depth of field. So it does work really well um, in this instance. So I'm going to roll with it. Let's go max blur 32. Um, let's set those settings as they are. And then let's give this a render. Um, okay, you can see the render is actually showing up black. And uh, I realize what I've done. Um, I set, I tried to turn off the depth of field for the camera um, by setting the f-stop to zero. But actually zero is maximum depth of field, as I said before. So you need to change it to radius and then set the radius size to zero. And then it will actually turn off depth of field. So just keep that in mind. So if we give this a render right now, um, what you should see is actually, you can see the diamond's actually got the diamond. The emerald's got a lot of uh, light to it. And that's because it's using the world settings. But actually when it's up close, we don't actually want all those refractions going on. We only want that later on. So the way we're going to do that is by actually doing a little bit of, uh, I guess, kind of cheating. It's not physically accurate, but it's, uh, it's what you do for logo animations, I guess. You've got you to gotta just work until it works, I guess. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to set the, uh, the background strength for this at the very start, uh, let's say up until about frame 90. Nah, frame, let's go once it's about there. So about frame 140, I'm going to set this, now let's go 160, set a keyframe for that strength, and then 140, I'm going to set another keyframe for zero. So now if we give this a render, we shouldn't actually see all those refractions coming through. Okay, so it's looking a lot better now. Cool. All right, let's see how this looks when it's rendered. Okay, so you can see, uh, I stopped the render already. Um, you can see there's a problem. We've got the the, uh, the planes, which are casting reflections and stuff on our text, and it's showing up in the refraction here. So there's one thing we can do to stop that, and that is down here underneath the object, like uh, with our panel, sorry, with our plane here selected. Um, if we just turn off transmission, for both of those and that will stop that and also I realized we need to make sure that the there is light that is actually going to our text here so that we can actually see it so one thing I did uh, with my final animation was I actually animated it so that this plane that you can see right here actually followed this path of this uh, of this text so if I just have a look at you know where that animation stops so it stops about yeah frame 250 or whatever if I just make a uh, make a keyframe there for location and then from when it starts moving, which is about a frame, I guess, 110. Let's just move this back. Position this about there, let's say. And then let's set another location there. So now that plane will actually follow that down there. So that means that in, the, uh, in this refracted glass from the emerald, you should actually now be able to see the text on the other side. Oh, one other thing, the pictures. Uh, that actually needs to be animated as well. So, um, so we'll just keep that where that is, and I'm going to move it. Let's say so. Once everything starts moving, is about let's go 120. I'm going to position this behind the camera, right there. Let's go. Oh, location and rotation, both of them together, and then let's rotate that as well. So it's got a little bit of a twist to it, I guess, something like that set location rotation and then now if I have a look at the through the uh, through where the camera is looking there we go that's pretty perfect actually I'm surprised that actually came out right first time I think last time it was a lot harder but anyway um, cool all right so let's give this another render now and let's see how that looks um, all right well you can see that uh, it's it's missing <laughs> the text in the refracted emerald there so I think this is actually too close and it's perhaps uh, it's kind of missing it, or perhaps it is uh, it's a little bit off. So if I position it there, perhaps and maybe a little bit more forward, and then set that there instead. Okay, let's just take a look at that now. I just give that another render. It takes a while before you've got it right. I think I trialed maybe about thirty different positions for the emerald. Um, and different, you know, movements and things like that before I got it so that, you know, the text was rendering enough and, you know, it was at the right angle. So it really is just a matter of trial and error. And you can see, again, it's not really getting the, uh, the text like we want it. So I'm going to have to let's make sure you got it on the right keyframe. Let's move that out a little bit. I'm not sure why it's... Uh, 
not sure why it's not really showing up. I guess it really does depend on how the uh, the emerald is positioned as to whether or not you're actually going to get the actual text showing through. So it's all very important. If you don't get it right, you're going to miss it, of course. Um, and I think I think we can actually see some of the text showing through. Oh yes, there's part of the A right there. Yes. Okay. Cool. So I think what we can do, if that's where that plane starts moving. I'm going to position this forward. Let's move that there. Location, rotation. Let's give that another quick render. I don't think there's actually light which is hitting the uh, hitting that text like it should. I think actually it should probably be higher perhaps. Let's just set that. Let's see if we're getting any now. No, still missing it. It's just one of those things. There we go. All right. We finally got some light on our text where it is. You can see it's a little bit fiddly, um, this whole process, this animation. Um, yeah, it's a whole bunch of tricks, a bunch of hacks um, to try to get it so that, um, so that it works just enough so that the animation plays out and the audience is fooled and that's all that needs to be done. It's only 10 seconds long um, and that's, that's really all there is to it. It's just a big... It's a big magic trick, basically. Anyway, let's uh, let's take a look once it's finished rendering. But a bing, and there it is uh, with the def this, the uh, defocus um, effect showing through as well. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I think we can now draw the tutorial to a close. We've got the animation pretty much exactly uh, as it pans out in the final one. Everything else is, uh, is carefully planned as it was. Um, now I'm going to include the final uh, project file that I used for my final scene, which is this one right here. So there are, there are a few things that I did differently. Um, I guess mainly one of the biggest ones was that, uh, and actually in order to get it rendered and you know in time for this tutorial, I actually had to cheat. So I used the, uh, as I said before, I used the defocus node, um, which we just used then. And then I also used, as well as that, I used the normal one, which is from the camera. Um, right here, so that as the, the text pulled out there, it then switched over to uh, the defocus on the camera instead of the fake defocus in the compositor. Really complicated. Um, basically, all I did was I rendered two sets of frames, so that like I rendered half the animation on that, and then I flipped it, I changed some stuff, and then I rendered the start of it using the defocus node. And that's because when the text was in the distance using just the defocus node, it was getting some weird artifacts around the edge of the text. So I had to do some fancy stuff like that. Anyway, um, there's always a little bit of stuff which I can't really show you in the tutorials because, you know, it's either not appropriate um, and I just had to do it in order to get it to work for the tutorial or um, it's just going to take too long and it's just not really part of it. But anyway, so I'm going to include the, uh, the final one. This is pretty much it, exactly how it is. Um, so you guys can download that. You can pull it apart and uh, have a bit of fun with it. And uh, I'm really interested to see what you guys create with this tutorial. You can see I added another little, that little shiny gleam effect. You can check that out there as well. Uh, I'm interested to see what you create with this. So if you make a cool logo introduction um, for your company or brand or whatever it is, um, and you, yeah, using this tutorial, if you, if you create something cool, do send it to me or leave a comment below or something like that. Let me know because I'm really interested in seeing what you guys create. It's always fun to check out other people's uh, stuff that they make. So um, that's it from me, guys. I hope you learned something, and I will see you next time.